Hello, sir. Hello, Ted. How are you today? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing splendidly. Thank you for asking. I love the setup. Looking very, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. You as well. Um, the undisclosed location in the <laughs> Northeast. <laughs> that's right. That's right. My wife and I just moved. We just moved with our, our baby boy to Connecticut. So, um, yeah, we moved on Halloween. So this is, uh, this is the undisclosed <sighs> location. Oh, man. Congrats on the move, by the way. How, uh, thank you. Thank you. I, I'm sure that was quite a bit of a challenge in the, mid of, in the midst of this pandemic that we've got going on here. Pretty nuts, man. Pretty nuts. Yeah. But uh, we're on the other side of it now. And uh, yeah, everything is, everything is good. But yeah, it's, we had been looking to get out of Queens for like the last year or so. We were in like a two bedroom. So now it's, we have a house and it's, it's nice. Oh man, you guys finally ended up pulling the trigger after the naughty Zillow links. That's right. That's right. That was the inspiration. <laughs> it all paid off. <laughs> it's so funny. My wife and I, we were watching together and we were cracking up at that part because I think we started it back when we were living on the East Coast. We live in Arizona now. Nice. Like, we'd be on the train going to New York and we'd be sending links to each other. Be like, oh, wouldn't that be nice? And so that really <laughs> hit home with us. And oh, yeah. we bought a house. And my wife is still sending me links. I'm like, I don't know what you want from me. We've got the house. <laughs> it's we, we've got to wait a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, and excuse me, do, uh, do you pronounce it uh, Stephen or Stefan? I just want to make sure I say it properly. Oh, thank you for asking. Stefan. 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 Okay, great. Yes, that's right. That's well, right. Yeah. Yes. And uh, by the way, I, I just have to let you know before the show, you are one of the nicest emailers I've ever emailed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's my calling card. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, using things like please, thank you, exclamation points, full sentences. It was just a breath of fresh air in this. Oh, uh, good, era. good. I'm very big on, I'm very big on that. You know, those are the ties that bind. Those are the last threads that like, keeping us as a society. So I, <laughs> I try to uphold. Hello, everybody. And welcome to a comedy advice podcast. My name is Stefan, and I have a special guest. He's a comedian that's appeared on Letterman, Jimmy Kimmel, Craig Ferguson, Comedy Central, and more. He has five specials with his latest cut up. Everybody welcome Ted Alexandro. Oh my goodness, man. A lot of effort went into that theme song and I, I appreciate it. I get the nod. I, oh, I appreciate that. And if you guys, listeners, have not, if you don't get it, go on over in the show notes, watch Ted's new special cut up on YouTube for free. And then you'll you'll get it. I also I, I thought I was good at first. The 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 start was strong, and then it kind of trailed off. But I'll I think it was hard. strong throughout. Strong throughout. <laughs> you had a you had a muscle through a few syllables, but uh, well done. Oh, thank you. My wife told me if I didn't do that, she was gonna barge in and be like, "You didn't sing the song." So <laughs> I had to. She heard it. Oh. She's giving me the thumbs up. I'm glad but, she was the enforcer. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Ted. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show, and I wanted to talk a little about your special cut up. You also had another special though, stay at home comedian that was spliced up Teddy Grams or for the secular community, the Instagram lives of Ted Alexandro slash you. What, and you also have the Ted Alexandro show. All of these things seem to have blossomed in a time where <laughs> there's a very desolate creative atmosphere. How did you end up getting into this productive mode and start saying, you know what, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to start sprouting beautiful, creative things? <laughs> well, well, thank you, Stefan. For me, you know, uh, it's weird finding myself during the pandemic being in some ways busier than ever. Uh, and on top of everything, we, we just moved too. So as if I didn't have enough going on, putting out two comedy specials and starting a live stream, uh, yeah, so th th there's been a lot, but I don't know. I, you know, I've always been one to kind of follow my instincts and maybe the sense that everything was shutting down, uh, inspired me to like step up and just like figure out ways to still be creative or expressive. So yeah, that first one was a total, uh, accident. The stay at home comedian one. I, I just made it literally in my living room. Uh, it was just Instagram lives, like you said, yeah. and I sent it over to my editor and, and said, I think we can kind of piece together. It was like over maybe two weeks or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. I said, I think we can kind of piece together something that might be a good 
like reflection of, of these times. He put it together. And, and weirdly enough, I've been doing comedy for over 25 years. Uh, this was the special that the New York Times wrote about. So, you know, <laughs> you don't need a high budget. Just shoot something on Instagram in your living room. And uh, that's, that's what works. I saw that too on the New York Times article, which praised the work that you did in the, in the special. I was watching it and cracking up. I also saw tons of other people because it showed the feed with people commenting, and, including yes. Jim Gaffigan, who looks like trolled you at some times, telling, <laughs> saying, hey, stop calling it the China virus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jim and I have been touring together for like close to seven years. So uh, yeah, he would hop on from time to time. He actually uh, came in and we had a, you know, a chat for, you know, I guess probably an hour or so one of the times that that wasn't included in the special. But yeah, uh, yeah you know, we've we've known each other a long time. So it was this this kind of organic thing that happened. It was not planned. And like I said, it, it turned out uh, really, really well. And then the second one was the special that I was working on and was planning actually to shoot. Uh, that's called Cut Up. So mm -hmm. that was going to be shot you know, more in a traditional comedy special sense uh, in a theater and all that stuff. But then once the pandemic hit, uh, again, I spoke to my, my editor, my friend, Matthew L. Weiss, and uh, I said, let's put together the footage that we've already shot of the special, you know, because I've been doing this material for the last year plus. So uh, that's what we did. That's what, you know, that gave birth to the name Cut Up that we, we put together this special from a bunch of different locations, a bunch of different sets. And so, yeah, that was the second one. And not to, not to say that we're done yet. I, I have a third one coming out in December. It's called the lost album. Oh my God. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I can't stop now. You know, it's like, I, I, it just occurred to me, you know, I have like a, like an eight year period where I didn't put out an album and yeah. uh, I was doing sets on Letterman. I was doing sets on Conan, you know, stuff that I was proud of. But I, for whatever reason, I just did not put out an album. So I'm like, you know what? Let me put out the Lost album, this, this material that, that I love mm -hmm. that just uh, I never put out properly on an album. So that's, that's coming up down the pike now. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. That is so good. And I, I have to say, I thoroughly enjoyed Cut Up. Not just from, oh, wow, this is hilarious. But I just felt like you look at a piece of uh, a masterpiece or you look at a, a piece of art and you're like, holy shit, you just have to admire all the work that's been put into it. And as you said, you've been doing comedy for 25 years plus, And you can tell in the joke writing that it's just so masterful. And one of the, one of my favorite jokes, I think my favorite joke of the year might be your shitting your pants story, which <laughs> I will leave the listeners to watch for that. I also though wanted to point out in the, <laughs> my, my wife. Yeah, please, go ahead, please. Go ahead. I, well, I was gonna say, that, uh, I was just telling someone actually that that was a joke that took me like a year to actually tell on stage because I, I kind of almost talked myself out of it. I was like, ah, it's just a story about shitting my pants. Uh, but then eventually I started telling it and, you know, I realized like, oh, well, you know, this is actually a lot more than just shitting my pants. Cause it happened like right after my wedding. So, uh, I'll give you that much of a tease for your, for your viewers to, uh, to check it out and cut up. Uh, that's beautiful. And maybe my wife won't appreciate this, but she's away from the door now. So she also, <laughs> she had a, a similar experience. And so she was cracking up and she, I don't, it's weird to say she doesn't like comedy, but she's not a huge fan like I am and a comedy nerd. I, I don't care for comedy either. She and I share that in common. <laughs> <laughs> but she was cracking up at that. So I thought, oh God. You know what's funny? I mean, that, uh, thank you for saying that. Like I, I found out once you share a story like that publicly, you just get inundated with people saying like, yeah, same thing. They, people tell you their uh, shit my pants story. So yeah, there's quite a large community, it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you look at Reddit, they've got this huge thread on all the shit your pants stories. But yeah, um, yeah. I'll, I'll put the link in the show notes for anyone that's interested. But to the other jokes, they're also, I love the inappropriate theme where you're at the age now where things, you, you just call them out and be like, is that, that's inappropriate, isn't it? And I love, I'm going to try not to spoil this too much, but the joke about when you're in the gym, you hear the song and you repeat the lyrics to the song and you're like, that's inappropriate. And the crowd just dies laughing and you could have left it there. But then you're like, no, it's actually inappropriate, not because of the lyrics, but because of this. 
and then you take them for a turn and the audience follows you right there and just starts cracking up. And then you paint it with a picture of children. I told this in the most unfunny way possible, by the way. But, you know, <laughs> I, appre I appreciate you, uh, you know, uh, appreciating the various parts of the joke because that is a joke. You know, for me, it's, I do love comedy and the way material comes together. And that was a joke that I was telling for years in, in different parts, you know, and it, it never really fully came together until like those last few months before the special where I was like, you know what, let me, let me bring that back. And I kind of tied it together and I brought in different things because uh, mm -hmm. it had been like these disparate parts of, of, a, of a different joke. And I kind of, you know, I put yeah. it all together and it worked and it turned into like a longer piece too. I think that particular joke is probably five minutes plus, you know, so it's kind of fun when you get something that, like you said, takes people on a, on a journey and has some twists and turns. Wow. Yeah, it was absolutely a great joke. And I, well, series of jokes, I guess, or bit, I guess we could call it, but yeah. it, it was, uh, gosh, I just wish I could write like that. But I wanted to ask too, because I was going to ask if it was a joke that just accumulated over time with fixing it up and things like that. Is that usually how the jokes that you end up writing come together where you start off with this nice little meaty chunk of humor, and then you start to add to it over time and I, and I was going to ask too, how are you able to do those connections? Because with doing comedy over 25 years, how far back do you reach sometimes? Or how do you remember, oh, I've got this little nugget sitting in my back, back closet and I've got this thing that I can add to it? Yeah, well, it varies. You know, some of them come out fully formed and that's the joke, you know, like the first night you're like, wow, you know, that thing's done. And, you know, you don't really nice. have to tweak it too much. So those are a gift when those happen. Uh, but for the most part, it is a series of kind of tweaking and polishing. And I always mm -hmm. tell people, uh, comedians, uh, you know, this is kind of common knowledge, but you should always record your sets, if not video, at least audio, so that if something does happen in the moment, uh, you remember it, you know, and you remember how you told it and why the crowd laughed. So you get, you know, you get the right rhythm to it because all of those little nuances, otherwise you can very easily forget and it's lost and you'll be killing yourself. Like, oh, well, you know, what did I say? Like, how did I say that? Why, why is it not working the way it did that night? You know, so if you record it, then you can, you can listen back. So this particular joke, it, this might be the joke in my career that is the longest journey from inception to like full polished bit because like i said i put it on the shelf for literally years like probably three or four years i remember telling that joke and just like leaving it alone but then uh like another part came about like the gym and then the story about the uh yeah the music festival the comedy festival yeah. uh so it kind of all came together and and then it was ready it was done you know so you know, it's weird. Like, it's not like I have a file of like, oh, let me revisit this. It just sometimes right. you get onto a theme. And I think the inappropriate theme, I was like, you know what, this, this might fit here. And, you know, so then you have like a full piece that you're talking about getting older, you're talking about your perspective, how certain things now you find inappropriate that, you, you know, you never would have when you were younger. So it, it kind of just took shape. And it, it took a long time. But uh, yeah, that's kind of the fun, man. Like you, you get surprised even by your, by your own stuff and the way it comes back around. That's, that's beautiful. And a lesson for life, really. I feel like there are things that happened I agree. Yeah. in the past that- Don't that give up. Learn. Yes, yes, please, please, guys, <laughs> don't give up. Don't give up. Uh, and it's so cool listening because I, I listened or watched your previous special and it's kind of cool to see how you've got not only these jokes that have compiled over time, but attached to these kind of autobiographical segments where in this latest special cut up, you talk about how you and your wife are expecting a baby, which congrats, by the way. Thank you. Um, thank you. It's out and in the world. Uh, yes, yes. Coming up on, uh, <laughs> he'll be a year on, on Christmas. Oh my gosh. Wow. That's, congratulations. Thank um, you. And, and then before that, your special, you talked about how you ended up meeting and breaking up with and then meeting again your wife talk, yeah talk about not giving up that was like 10 years in between that too oh so my maybe, gosh. maybe there's a theme <laughs> <laughs> um and then and speaking of not giving up with 
all of this stuff that's going on, quarantine and, and trying to stay inside, comedy shows not really happening anymore, and you being able to do the Ted Alexander Show. On Patreon, you also have, and I was thinking about it as you were giving tidbits and tips, all sorts of bo bonus content, including, a, I forgot exactly what it was called, but the uh, The Ted Academy. Alexander Comedy Academy, yes. Yes, where, where you're teaching comedy, and I could think of no better person to teach it at the moment. And all of this stuff that you've got going on, it just mean, it seems to me like you're not giving up and it's really a passion for you, comedy. And it made me think of an interview that I had heard, I think it was Mindless Metal Jacket with you and Joe List, where oh, yeah. you were talking about growing up and, and your family being one of five, which I also <laughs> grew up one of five in a Catholic family. Nice. My parents a little different than, than your parents, but I really <laughs> enjoyed listening to a lot of it, including the story of how your dad, he was, he was an accountant. He did not like being an accountant. And you guys almost moved because he was going to accept a job. Yeah, we were and on the verge. I, we were on the verge of moving to Chicago. Yeah. Wow. And then he decided, you know what? I don't love this. I love being a teacher. And then I'm going to be a teacher. And so he was able to be home more and kind of prioritize family a little bit and mm -hmm. also doing what he loved. And it seems like you are following that path not follow you like you're in that path too where you're doing what you love you also have your family um and you're finding ways to make what you love really work which is is really inspiring thanks yeah no that is um definitely something that i was taught by both my mom and dad like prioritizing family because those things can get away from you very quickly if you don't or if you just kind of go with the flow of life or you allow you know work obligations or other things to kind of pull you away before you know it, like, you know, time goes by and, and, you, and you haven't really prioritized the most important things. So mm -hmm. definitely for me, and I think the pandemic, again, in a weird way helps with this because you know, pretty much my son's entire life, uh, you know, we pretty much went on lockdown like two months after he was born. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had that gift of being present and being home every day when he wakes up and put him to bed and, you know, give him a bath and all the things that you want to like, be there and not miss, you know, uh, and also just for my wife and I to spend time together. So uh, it's helped with that. Um, it's kind of forced it probably in ways that wouldn't have occurred. I would have been on the road, you know, like I said, traveling with with Jim Gaffigan, where, you know, we, we kept up a pretty relentless uh, touring oh, wow. schedule. So uh, it's been a nice kind of detachment from that and a chance to kind of live a different pace and a different life. And to still remain creative. And like you said, the Ted Alexandro show, I've been live streaming uh, twice a week. Um, and I have all sorts of guests. Like we had Brian Regan, we had Jim Gaffigan, Judah Friedlander, Judy Gold, all, all sorts of Todd Barry. Um, and we talk comedy, we talk life. Uh, so that's, that's been a really good outlet too, to kind of extemporaneously talk about what's going on in the world and then also interview or just chat with my friends. Yeah. That, that's really beautiful and, and not to try and tie it together like a 90s sitcom, but the, of your mother as well. I know that she was and, and you are a an avid activist, which I think is really it's inspired me a little bit where for some reason I always thought I haven't I don't have time for this and I don't have the time and energy to be able to put my passion into helping others in the way that people are out there either protesting or or organizing ways to be able to try and make a better life for people. And I feel like you have been able to not just do comedy family, but as your mom, I think you would said she was, they were Catholic, but she was also pushing for things like, I think it was women as priests or, or different things like that, which is gay, gay priests. Yeah. Gay priests. priests. And, yeah. All that. She was pretty radical, especially in, you know, growing up in the eighties. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then getting to see you one, I mean, tying it into your comedy in ways that are, it's so hard to be able to do that to just make something funny first off, but then make something that might trigger some people funny, even more challenging. And then also things like um, I, I had seen that you were you had formed the the American Comedy Coalition, I think it's called uh, for New, better New York Comedy, New York Comedians Coalition. For, New a, for York, a pay raise. yeah, and and you were able to get comedians a pay raise for the first time since the '80s, I think. That's and right. Yeah, 
with, with along with a bunch of other people. Yeah, I did it once uh, around 2000, where I did it. That was kind of uh, my own effort. Uh, I wrote up a petition and I got comedians to sign it. So that was the first time, and we got a, a slight raise that time. And then again in like maybe 2007 or so, uh, Russ Maniv, uh New York-based comedian, reached out and said, "Do you want to do this a second round?" Because you know people were still kind of grumbling about how the pay wasn't really, you know, decent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we did it, uh, we did it again the second time. And that, that was the New York Comedians Coalition. That was more of a concerted, uh, sustained effort. And we worked in concert with um, AFTRA. AFTRA was kind of uh, a guy, a, a lawyer, Stephen Burroughs, was, uh, was very helpful, you know, on the legal side of things, helping us and kind of uh, advising us. But we got a we got a pay raise that second time as well. So there was about three hundred comedians involved in in that. So yeah, that was uh, you know I was proud to be part of that and to to get a raise for comedians in New York on two different occasions. That is so incredible. I w I was gonna ask too. I mean, for people similar to myself, like what what is the best way you think people if they want to get involved to to do it especially now where there's a lot of stuff going on with with coronavirus yeah yeah well i mean there is no lack of opportunity to get involved with any number of causes if something speaks to you uh and what i tell people is just show up that's all activism is you don't have to feel like you have all the answers i mean right. it's probably better to just have a lot of questions you know um but if you if you feel like your presence, uh, you know, like you said, right now in lockdown, there's, there's not a whole lot going on. But um, once things open up again, if there is some sort of gathering or some sort of uh, rally or something for mm -hmm. a cause that speaks to you, I just feel as though uh, it's good for the soul. You know, it's good for you to be yeah. there because people have this thing of activism as like that you, you know, that you're like, somehow first of all that it's organized it's it's just people showing up you know it's like you don't know it's like oh i've never <laughs> met this person that you know maybe you go with a friend or whatever yeah but it's not yeah. like this organization it's just like uh -huh. people showing up for a cause and there's a humility in that and there's you know it's not that you're like even leading the charge it's just like you're another body there who says yeah i'm lending my physical presence because i believe this to be true you know so there's there's something nice about being part of that whole that is uh, trying to affect change. Wow, that's that's beautiful. Are you your parents' favorite out of all? Of them? <laughs> I mean, you probably get five different answers if you ask all, <laughs> all five of us. Um, but yeah, I, was, I might as well say I might as well say yes for myself. <laughs> Uh, well, Ted, thank you so much. We're going to get into the advice portion of the podcast, but I just wanted to ask really, really quickly, you know, where can people find you? What have you got going on? What would you like to plug just before we get into that part? Well, the main place to find me uh, these days is my YouTube channel, Ted Alexandro on YouTube. The Ted Alexandro show is live streaming right now. It's every Thursday, uh, but we'll be going back to twice a week soon. Uh, nice. with the move and everything, you know, things got a little bit hectic. So I scaled it back to, to once, once a week, but all the episodes are, are on my YouTube channel. And of course on all social media at Ted Alexandro. That's awesome. And it's an amazing show. I'll have a link to all of that in the show notes. So you guys can go right to the YouTube channel. That's where cut up is, uh, where stay at home comedian is. And, um, it's, I know it's a few years old, but teacher's lounge, which it's yeah. amazing. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. That was a that was a great experience. Uh, my buddy Hollis James, who I went to college with and kind of started in comedy with, mm -hmm. uh, he and I co-wrote and co-starred in this web series, Teachers Lounge, that is kind of based on my early teaching years. I taught music for five years in New York City elementary schools for like the first five years out of college. So I was uh, teaching during the day. I was starting to do stand up at night. Uh, mm -hmm. So we wrote this web series, Teacher's Lounge, where I play the music teacher, Hollis plays the janitor, and we're always just hanging out in the teacher's lounge of the school, and then different comedians come in playing various <laughs> faculty members. So Jim Gaffigan plays the school nutritionist, uh, <laughs> Judy Gold is the gym teacher, and you know Todd Barry's the librarian. There's 10 of them, and it's, it's great. It's just every comedian just hit it out of the park, and 
we tried to write it in such a way, David Tell is the school photographer. I can't believe yes. it. Uh, so we tried to write it in such a way that we captured who they are and, and their, their kind of personality. But then they uh -huh. took, it, took it and ran with it. We tried to like leave room for improvisation. And, and David Tell definitely, is, I think, is the best example. He really <laughs> ran with it. And it was beautiful. Oh, my God. That was so good when he's taking a picture of you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was, was just in the, in the moment. You know, none of that was on the page. It was just uh, that was just improvising. Oh, my God. That was incredible. And then um, uh, Jim Norton also did an amazing job. Too. Fantastic. Yeah, I've known Jim for many years in the New York comedy scene. And uh, I didn't know what a great actor he was. We asked him to play the uh, head of school security. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> yeah, he came, I would say, honestly, out of the 10 people that came in, he was the most prepared. Like he had everything. Mm -hmm. He had questions for us. He was very, very professional and prepared and was wow. just so great. That's another one of my, I mean, I love them all. Uh, right. Yeah, Jim, Jim Norton was, was fantastic. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. Well, we're going to get into the oh, advice. People oh, can watch but, those, by the way, uh, on my YouTube channel as well. All 10 episodes of Teacher's Lounge are on, uh, on my YouTube channel. Yes. There are hours and hours of free content on Ted's YouTube channel, guys. So go on over there, click and visit. That's it. All right. Well, we're going to get into the advice, but before we answer the questions, I have an inspirational quote to help right. get us jazzed to be able to answer these questions. Before I give mine, I like to ask my guests if they have any inspirational quotes that they tend to flock to when they're having some troubled days or. Um, do I have inspirational quotes? I think this head has a bunch of stuff on it, doesn't it? No. <laughs> no, it, this, this just locates the various parts of the brain, I think. Um, <laughs> that would be amazing if it did, though. A little inspirational quote on each part. You're doing great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always remember, just because I used to play, uh, I played basketball in, in high school, um, that... Uh, Coach John Wooden of UCLA fame had uh, a quote that uh, just popped into my head when you asked. Mm -hmm. um, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Uh, so I just, I remember that from time to time, uh, you know, not that I'm like this hard ass, but I, but I, I do think preparation, uh, as I was just saying with, with Jim Norton, like, you know, putting in preparation kind of, does prepare you to uh, put yourself in position to succeed. Hmm. That is an excellent quote. Maybe you could Sharpie that one in on one of the parts of the brain. Yeah, that maybe that's nice. a good spot. <laughs> the, the hypothalamus or that's the only part I know really. <laughs> You're ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that's an, actually a really good quote that's gonna put mine to shame. My quote that I've brought is not by any person, it's by a robot and it's called Inspirobot. And what it does is it uses AI to generate, it takes some of the wisest words known to man, and then it just mashes them together for an inspirational quote. I like so it. we'll try and decipher this one. Um, oh, but this that, week- That's a better use of AI than a lot of other ones I've heard. So let's, let's hear it. <laughs> just wait till you hear the quote and then, then you can see if that's true. All right. <clears throat> this week's quote, it says, all it takes to go from a beginner to a pro is a spanking. Mm, that is wise. <laughs> that is, that's, I think John Wooden might have said that as well. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, may, maybe Inspirebot is going metaphorical here. Like, if you give a metaphorical spanking, as in, um, yeah. you can do it, a pat it's on the possible. tush. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know what we don't know what Inspiron is. Uh, Inspire robot is is into you know no judgments obviously. <laughs> that is true. Maybe some some malicious websites got into its AI algorithm. So maybe uh, uh, something else. But any any other inspired to draw from that before we get to the questions, Ted? No, I'm ready. To, I'm inspired. I'm ready to go, man. Let's let's Pumped. let's jump right in. All right, so we've got our first question. This is found by our fan Aiden. Thank you, Aiden. It's on Reddit, and it says. Need help turning down my aunt in a gentle way. My aunt is always trying to do nice things for me as a way of bonding with her. The only thing is these things are usually things that I'm really not interested in. 
Just this morning, she asked me if I wanted to take a class to learn how to install eyelashes. She says she's willing to pay for it, but I have no interest in that. I'm afraid to tell her because she can be kind of sensitive. What do I do? I don't think this requires any tact or uh, you don't have to massage this in any way. Just say, what the hell are you, why are you asking me this? My, I, my uh, installing eyelashes? <laughs> like, I think you really, ha you have to, you have to hurt her. You have to really hurt <laughs> her. You have to hurt her feelings in a way that she never asks you these kinds of things again uh, and make it memorable. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> There's a nice way to there's a nice way to do it, obviously, but uh, in this case, just go for it. Yeah, go for not a vital organ, but one that makes her remember. Leave that yeah, scar, no. so if she ever hears the word eyelash again, she'll think yeah. back to that moment. That's right. Oh. Scar her. Uh, what, what did you say? The hippo. Uh, hippo. What? The hippo. Hypothalamus. I think. Yeah. It was. Scar her hypothalamus. <laughs> that, those are your markers, <laughs> Aiden. <laughs> You know what? Funnily enough, I think the hypothalamus is the verbal part of the brain. So she won't ask you to do anything ever again. There you go. We, we've, I, we've solved it. And I think the medical community would, would approve. Yes. FDA has already given. <laughs> yes. Okay. We're good. We're good with that. All right. We've got our next question. This is actually brought by fan Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. It's also from Reddit. It says, how do I get over my fear of medical needles? Hi, I'm... Shaq, Shazg, I'm 14 and I have a fear of medical needles. I always have and I fear I always will. Since the whole COVID-19 thing is happening, I'm going to the doctor with my mother soon for a yearly checkup. I really want to get all my shots, but whenever they're mentioned, I have a panic attack or freeze up like a deer in headlights. How do I stop being afraid? I want to protect those around me, but getting shots scares the shit out of me. Help? Melissa, you know, there's nothing wrong with being afraid. I think it's justified in this particular case. Uh, and clearly you're coming from a good place. You're coming from good intent, not wanting others to be put in harm's way. Uh, but think of it as heroic. You know, you're, you're essentially going on to the battlefield and you are taking, you're being wounded for your fellow human beings. It, you know, maybe in some way, if that can inspire you, think of it not as an annual visit to a doctor. Think of it as a battle, uh, and you are prepared to die if need be, but you will simply be wounded. That's the good news. That is excellent news, and I think it's a good way to look at it. I mean, if you think about it, some of the biggest martyrs in history were hit with needles. Like Jesus was, there were big needles. But That's like true. Kind of needles in the hands for us yeah. and and your sins and your ability. <laughs> to accept your needle. So yeah, I, I may have offended a large portion of my audience, but uh, you know, I think that needles is a type of martyrdom for you to be able to be strong for yes. your family. Absolutely. I think that's the way Jesus looked at it really is just, he probably had fear of, of those particular needles as well. And that's he, that's not only did he overcome, overcome it, but he came back three days later. So Melissa, <laughs> The bar is high, but, you know, nobody thought he could do it. That's right. I think he was sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. I can't pronounce the word, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. He was terrified. If he there was, was a Reddit, yeah. he would have been on here. Like, yeah. bros, help me out. I'm scared of these big old iron needles. Help. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well. I think that's the last question, Ted. So before we go, I just wanted to say huge thank you for coming on the show, telling us about yourself, all of the stuff that you have going on and answering some questions about needles. Oh, Stefan, my pleasure. I appreciate uh, all of your questions and, and uh, all the kind words. And uh, yeah, man, let, let's do it again down the line. But, but thank you so much for having me. And thanks to the, the folks who submitted those questions. I hope we, uh, we did not lead them astray in any way. Uh, I have a feeling I, I, we might have changed some lives. That's true. And also, I should add a disclaimer at the very front of the podcast to say, you know, please do not take this seriously or right. whatever. You know, whatever. They can figure it out. <laughs> but anyway, Ted, uh, I just wanted to also, since it takes our listeners a couple times to get in the gist of it, where can people find you? What have you got going on? What have you like to plug? Uh, Check out the Ted Alexandro show on my YouTube channel. 
and uh, on social media, all the various uh, social medias at Ted Alexandro. Again, it's all going to be in the show notes, everybody. So you can, there's no excuse, literally, unless you're held down by needles, go right. down, click on the link and, uh, you know, follow your heart, follow your hippocampus or hypothalamus, whatever. That's right. <sighs> it's, all right. It, it will not lead you astray. The show notes are there for you. And so are we. That's right. Oh, a scripture of sorts. The podcast scripture. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ted. And um, we'll talk to everybody soon. Thank you.